So I've got two windows which have, uh, you know, got one is basically to look at, you know, an organization from a perspective of how we are able to look at the range of HR strategies which can be applied within an organization. And I think in order to understand this LO, we need to look at a, a organization with the substantial size. Having said that, it's not necessarily, but, you know, maybe we can see the the broad perspective of, you know, the range of strategies which, uh, you know, an organization can employ if we choose, uh, you know, a big enough organization. So I've looked at Network Rail and, uh, you know, what we've got is their strategic resource plan that we will dip into uh, while covering the learning outcome, uh, you know, three. Now, in learning outcome three, uh, before I get into that, we'll do a quick recap in terms of what we have uh, looked at covering, you know, so far. One of the things, if you recall, when we had discussed, uh, you know, what is the role of HR? And uh, to a certain extent, you know, where does that role apply? So what we looked at was um, we did a bit of discussion on you mentioning about, uh, you know, what does HR do in an organization? So here, uh, what I've done is I've kind of put that across as saying that, uh, hang on, I put that somewhere. So what I said, what you have said earlier, which I want to kind of aptly bring across here for a bit of a recap was that when you look at HR, HR does pretty much everything in, all, in the organization. They look after, uh, you know, anything starting with resources, their well-being, you know, their compensation, their reward, their benefits, if they have issues or problems that is to be resolved. Or you know if there are problems and issues which can which they can help in resolving. So all these areas are essentially what are called the functions of HR. But having moved forward from the uh, you know overall understanding of HRM, human resources management, what we also dealt into was to try and understand the key uh, bits which are revolving around how this department works. So we looked at the process of human resources planning. And in that, what we did was all the things that you had mentioned, recruitment, selection, reward strategy, you know, their performance, uh, well-being, welfare, health and safety, everything, compensation, all that. Then we break it down into individual components. And there are, you know, six or seven uh, key broad aspects uh, or areas that we say that when we look at, you know, human resources planning, they cover. And they look at things like, you know, recruitment and selection. We look at unions or ACAS or issues. We also look at training and development. We look at, you know, appraisals, performance management, talent management, succession planning. And these then tend to become individual functions of somebody who works in the organization as an HR. Now, at some stage in the learning outcome too, we then also looked at uh, briefly defining and relating strategy to HRM. So when we looked at the aspect and definition of strategy, we normally considered in the uh, you know case of business or business strategy but how do we relate the word strategy and combine it with hrm or human resources management that is where we looked at the aspect of understanding that when you look at long term planning uh, with specifically with respect to the human resources and their deployment within an organization that involves creating some sort of a plan and that plan when it is long term tends to relate to what is called the strategy. Now, in some organizations we looked at, uh, the planning could be for 12 months, 18 months, three years, five years. We look at Marks and Spencer's 10 years. We look at big companies like Kraft, Unilever, Procter & Gamble. We look at some you know, big charities uh, like Oxfam. There, the planning tends to be for a number of years. So when we look at this aspect of long-term vision of how human resources are going to be managed and deployed and utilized, to achieve aims and objectives set for the within the organization, aims and objectives being yearly, annually, you know, biannually, things like that. But when we look at mission and vision and combine that with the long-term planning, that is where the aspect of strategic HRM actually or the process of HR becoming strategic actually starts to emerge. Now, a lot of organizations put together a lot of strategies and sometimes when these strategies from a long-term perspective are put forward, what they then tend to do is basically look at um, mapping some of these strategies with regards to their competitors. So what the competitors are doing. So it could be, say, a simple example of mapping compensation. Uh, you know, if they are looking at deploying people uh, or hiring new resources within the organization, how do they set the bar for the salary, the benefits, the perks, 
or overall the compensation package, they have to look at a bit of, uh, you know, benchmarking with their competitors, with the market. And that is where, again, this function becomes, uh, you know, strategic. Now, in the third learning outcome, what we want to be able to do also, very briefly, uh, in the second learning outcome, we also looked at how do HR managers develop and deploy these strategies within the organization. So here is where we looked at some of the models. We looked at even, uh, you know, models like the theory of motivation, wherein Maslow's theory could be applied because there are employees at different grades and different levels and the different experience of number of years of working within the organization. So their motivation factors and how they get motivated uh, within the organization, they, uh, you know, also varies. So HR managers are able to, you know, kind of create uh, and then deploy some of these strategies which are related to, say, the uh, the key aspect of motivation uh, of an employee. So employees normally at the junior level, uh, you know, would have more motivation towards, uh, you know, just, um, uh, say, getting into the job role, to doing their day-to-day -day jobs, and at the end of the month, getting paid. But employees at the middle management level or at the middle level of the organization uh, are more concerned about, you know, job security, things like, uh, you know, wages, things like how uh, much role do they play within the organization and to a certain extent start looking at the aspect of responsibility that they shoulder, which allows them to move into, uh, which, which basically marries into what is called their career development or career development plans. And when you look at people in the senior management or, you know, the highest category of, uh, you know, uh, working within the organization wherein they have responsibility for other staff, uh, budget, for example, they look at risk assessments and things like that, wherein they have responsibility more than their day-to-day -day job description. That is where we see that HR then tends to be specific in applying and deploying the strategies required at that level to motivate that person. And in some cases, it could be just a 2%, 3% wage rise at the lower level, but at the middle level, you might want to not just look at a pay rise or you know, but it could be a rise in terms of responsibility, a promotion. And at the highest level, it could be things like stock option plan, you know, long-term career planning, uh, or moving into a strategic direction, leading some projects and things like that. So that is where the deployment of strategies tends to vary depending on how, where, and at, with what experience and at what level you work within the organization. And some part of this aspect involves what is called, you know, a lot of benchmarking that they do which is with respect to external agencies and organizations in order to ensure that what they are creating or putting together as a process internally works because they are able to match, you know, kind of related to what's happening in the market with regards to their, uh, you know, key other, other key market players or, you know, competitors. Is that okay in terms of a quick recap? Yeah, it's a quick recap. Um, and then what we are looking at in learning outcome three is primarily looking at understanding what are the range of strategies applied? You know, what could be the types of strategies which an HR manager could use, whether they are resource-based, it could be, you know, uh, strategies which are primarily related to capabilities or building capabilities. And in some cases, you will look at there will be strategies which are related to understanding the, you know, the value chain or where the organization actually works. Uh, in, in the whole ecosystem and then marrying it with all the aspects of, uh, and not marrying, but relating it to all the aspects which are important for the organization to function, which could be stakeholders, customers, suppliers, external bodies, and employees and staff within the organization. So in this learning outcome, we are looking at primarily focusing on uh, how does HR, uh, you know, identify three or four, you know, three, I think, in general, uh, broad-based strategies, and how do they then apply these strategies within the organization? So what I've done is put together a few slides which primarily focus on recapping plus also looking at explaining how a range of strategies are, uh, you know, looked at from a point of view of, uh, you know, HR manager's uh, you know, perspective or when you wear an HR manager's hat apart from, you know, doing your day-to-day -day role. So the first thing that we look at in particular would be to understand, you know, acquiring needs. So when I say acquiring needs, this is related to closely the theory of, uh, you know, McLean's acquired needs theory. Wherein what 
one of the strategies which HR sometimes tactically applies is to understand that um, there are you know individuals working within the organization which would need to acquire new skills, and in order for them to uh, acquire these new skills, they would need training. In some cases, you will see job rotation uh, becomes a possibility because if the if the managers feel that the person has become complacent or you know the job has become too mon mundane, then in those cases, what you will see is that the person uh, you know is uh, idly. Um, they, we do a bit of an analysis, which could be a SWOT analysis or, uh, you know, a performance appraisal. And what you do is you look at what are the uh, areas within the person has strength. And what you do is you look at a bit of a job rotation to put that person into a new role. And that new role allows the person to, you know, uh, start, you know, performing or maybe becoming a bit more, um, say, for example, a bit more um, uh tuned to performing those new responsibilities because he's got a new role and that new role allows uh, uh, in, in fact expects the person to be you know being proactive rather than reactive because here the need is that the person needs to adapt to the new role rather than uh, you know not do it uh, because then in that case the person would be you know obviously looking at um, being made redundant. The other uh, approach which sometimes HR managers do adopt when they look at um, you know applying this within the organization would be to look at task orientation and obviously creating an environment which in general encourages or you know creates motivation creates loyalty towards the organization so here we look at the McGregor's uh, theory X and Y which basically looks at uh, you know uh, providing a balanced working environment where the employees feel that they get what they need to be able to perform the job. And in some cases, they uh, and, and the other side of the thing would be to look at asking them to try out new things uh, or new ideas um, in order for them to be, you know, um, uh, have, in order for the organization to have something called innovation, uh, in order for the organization to have or take risks to be able to, you know, get higher performance and thereby you know, in terms of creating an atmosphere which allows the environment to become charged and in those cases brings out the best from individuals. So here, when we look at some of these strategies, what we're trying to do is relate some of the theories that we have studied earlier to see how HR can actually dip in to some of these theories to uh, look at employing a particular strategy at a particular level. So if I say acquired, uh, meeting acquired needs, this could be people who require reskilling have been working in a particular department or in a role for a number of years, but at some stage the organization does feel that the person is required and does a valuable or provides a valuable contribution to the organization. But at the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the same side, what they also feel is that in order for the person to be able to grow into that role, the person then needs to acquire new needs or new types of uh, skills, and that can be done if we look at, uh, you know, placing the employee. Um, or giving the employee or the staff new responsibilities or a tougher assignment, which allows the person to, you know, again, start exercising some of the skills, experience that they have gained over the years. Theory X and Y looks at, you know, a balanced approach, but at the same time, a more aggressive risk-taking approach, which allows the individuals to, you know, um, push boundaries, uh, try and achieve new, uh, you know, I would say, um, uh, try and achieve new areas in which, the organization is trying to improve performance or productivity, and that is where, you know, this balance uh, actually tends to uh, come in. The third approach, which I would suggest, which sometimes, uh, you know, HR departments, HR managers employ, is what is called the collaborative en environment approach. So here, we look at William Ochi's uh, Theory Z, which primarily means that here the HR tries to apply what is called the motivational, uh, you know, techniques. They try and motivate the individuals more to be able to get more out of, uh, in, in more in terms of performance and productivity. Now, in in this particular case, we also look at that the HR could also look at, uh, you know, deploying uh, resources from a point of view of their hierarchy. That means they look at grading, they look at uh, this distribution of responsibility and, you know, uh, the, the varying aspects of responsibility and basis the performance that they are able to get, the individuals can get rewarded for, say, for example, 
or get rewarded, uh, you know, for showing excellence in performance or exceeding the objective set or the goal set would be to look at things like promotion, increase in wages, uh, you know, it could be uh, performance bonuses. It could also mean that in some cases, um, the organization will also earmark or let's say identify you as a leader, as a future leader for uh, within the organization. And then they put you into something called uh, a talent management program or you know some sort of a training program uh, to either look at developing you uh, to take up senior roles, and that could be done through coaching in some cases, and it could be done through uh, you know mentoring in some cases by asking you to shadow a senior person in the organization which they do feel that is a role that you sh would be able to take or step into at, at a certain stage, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in your working and in your experience within the organization. So these kind of three different types of, you know, broad based strategies, what we do get to see which HR tends to apply, uh, you know, tend to have some sort of a background in relation to how individuals get motivated uh, what kind of, you know, drives them and to a certain extent, you know, um, the previous experience and the skills that they have, which can be, uh, you know, which, which can be actually utilized. And in some cases, retraining can be done to sharpen those skills for the individuals to get into, you know, different kind of roles. Is that okay? Yeah, do you only want to do the three? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to do the three. Now, this is what we generally get to see, which are, you know, looking at the motivation theories, the leadership theories that we've studied, and we, we just look at, looked at the cliched approach of how the three different types or, you know, a different type of strategy uh, normally in most companies can be applied by looking at, you know, what they need. So they go out and recruit. If they don't have somebody uh, that, they, uh, that they are not able to recruit or the budgets are out there, then they look at retraining the person within the organization. In a practical sense, if that is not the case, then sometimes what HR will do is they will create projects and those projects, they have a bit of a bidding internally. And when you see those bidding internally, what that means, the uh, organization is trying to do is redeploy some of their internal resources to try and see if they can, uh, the ones who are more ambitious, the ones who are more risk taking are then uh, given the relevant resources to be able to, you know, um, take out, take up that challenge and deliver for the organization. And the third would be, the cliche approach in which what most HR departments do when they set annual goals and, you know, the uh, aims and objectives set by the management on an annual basis, uh, and they need to look at hitting the targets or whether it's quality targets, service targets, sales targets, you know, any sort of uh, targets which are supposed to be hit. Here, the uh, HR tries to create what is called the collaborative environment wherein they have, uh, you know, what is to a certain extent, I would say a carrot and stick approach, which means if you do this, you get that. You do this, you get this. If you're able to perform this or you're able to better this, then you get that. And that is where, you know, they look at managing this uh, through this exercise. But when we look at, say, for example, the same approach, but on a strategic basis, you know, then I look at long term. So when we look at these three approaches that we've looked at, these three approaches are tactical. As I said earlier, because they are short term, uh, they could be, you know, with quarterly, six monthly, annual basis. But when we look at long term, we need to look at HR planning these uh, strategies on the basis of something which can be viable and which is viable in the sense that it, it is something which is long term. So we look at three different types of strategies here. One, which is based on resources. Now, this particular strategy looks at uh, the the context of how resources, what resources the organization actually possesses, what it needs to have, and how they can be deployed best to achieve the, uh, you know, uh, say, for example, the advantage or the USP that they are trying to hit in the market in terms of differentiation. So here, when we look at organizational capabilities, we divide it into three. We have tangible resources, we have intangible resources, and then the most important component, which is what is called the human resources. And then between these three uh, things, the organization looks at creating a resource-based strategy. And then they look at, you know, going to market to ensure that you've got the best people working in the best possible roles with the best possible compensation and the knowledge and experience. So that is where the organization is looking at 
setting its course to succeed because they believe that just if we have the right resources, we have the right people with the right skill set, we are uh, we are going to succeed provided these resources are made available to the employees, uh, you know, to go out and get that, uh, you know, objective fulfilled or get that uh, objective done. The second one that we will look at is sometimes organizations you will see will look at building capabilities and these capabilities are built not for short term, but for long term changes which are being introduced in the organization. Now, when we look at Marks and Spencer in particular, and the reason I've looked at picking up an example here is because when we look at building capabilities and relationship, it's a very generic thing. All organizations do that. Every organization needs to look at building capabilities. So they start off small. At some stage, they are trying to, you know, get into a position which is, uh, you know, becoming meaningful. And at some stage, they look at, you know, becoming big. So they're always building capabilities. And a lot of organizations are always looking at relationships because of the fact that when they work in the ecosystem, when we look at, say, healthcare organizations, when we look at charities, they work within an ecosystem. So they, uh, when I say ecosystem, there is there are different players, there are different uh, companies, there are different services which different companies provide. And then there are, uh, you know, different internal and external factors which actually affect the working of that organization. So in those cases, they try and build relationships. Now, the relationships help helps the companies to, uh, you know, better provide the services, maybe look at cost savings, improve their supply chain, or, or improve the quality of their, you know, uh, uh, delivery. It could also mean that they put some service level agreements in place, which allows their partners and suppliers to, you know, act on their behalf to be able to deliver, uh, you know, on the service level agreements which are set. And that is where this relationship actually comes into being. Now, if we have to understand this particular point and we look at the example of, say, Marks and Spencer, you, we've seen that this, this particular, you know, large organization, which has a history in the UK, has, has been losing a lot of business. Their sales, their turnover has been on a decline. Now, in order to reorient the business, in order to, for example, uh, make it relevant again with the market conditions, the management of Marks & Spencer has looked at redefining some of its capabilities in with regards to the changing uh, you know, market environment in the UK and elsewhere globally. So what we have seen is that this particular market, when we look at, we look at Tesco, for example, or we look at uh, a organization which has been running for a good 30, 40, 50 years, and when we look at the, the advent of social media, the advent of internet, e-commerce, which is happening, uh, the accessibility of information through mobile phones and smartphones and tablets and things like that. When we look at that, most of the companies which were solid companies uh, from a point of view of a business model approach, go to market, have have had, you know, have had, uh, their, you know, their, uh, let's put it this way, they have had to, you know, change to the requirements of the market. And the reason why that ha that is happening is that some of the ways in which they were operating earlier, you know, the business model or what in terms of the basics of going to go to market for these companies was defined some 20, 30, 40 years back when the environment or the market conditions were different. But today the market conditions are different. But in order for them to meet these market conditions and also uh, keep growing, uh, you know, uh, keep providing competitive products and services, we see that they have to reorient their business or rethink in terms of how they are going to do business in the next 30, 20 to 30, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And that is where the organizations are looking at, you know, reassessing their capabilities. They are looking at rebuilding their capabilities from a point of view of gap areas and then looking at putting uh, long term relationships in place, which will allow them, uh, you know, to again grow their business. So, one of the strategies which HR does apply, and when they look at you know some organizations like when we had the last financial crisis in 2007-2008, we saw a lot of organizations laying off manpower, making uh, you know people redundant. But there there were very few companies which did not do this, uh, and they tried or they successfully unsuccessfully I don't know, but they tried to tide over those uh, times unfavorable times by retaining and holding on to their manpower. 
So their idea was that if we are able to build and or at least retain our capacities in terms of human resources during a tough time, we sh we will then be able to look at rebuilding, uh, you know, our capacities with the same resources when the favorable time, uh, you know, comes back again. And there are very few companies which have done that even during the, uh, you know, recent financial recession. And Marks and Spencer has used that opportunity as an organization, as an example that I've taken here, to kind of look at rebuilding its capacities and realigning its business, considering the next 20 years uh, in terms of, you know, how the future is going to work or how retailing in general is going to work within, within the UK and elsewhere globally. So that example, you know, explains that when they put a plan A in place to reduce uh, waste going to landfills, recycling, renewable energy being used in some of their stores to be able to power, you know, machinery, electricity, and things like that. They have looked at comprehensively uh, kind of, you know, rebuilding their capacities to reorient the business and make it successful within the 21st century. Now, some parts of that are growing. You look at Marks and Spencer Food, it is uh, it, it is growing, it is generating profits for the company, but when you look at clothes, when you look at food and grocery, when you look at home, Marks and Spencer Home, these are some of the laggards which primarily are not growing or not showing enough robust growth for the company to be able to make independent profit in this, uh, you know, in, in this particular sector. So here, Marks and Spencer is looking at, uh, in terms of HR, they don't want to lay off a lot of employees because they understand their face of the organization is, you know, staff and employees which deal with customers on a day in, day out from their stores, from their retail locations. So they are looking at building uh, or reskilling in this case, if I use the word, uh, uh, adapting, uh, you know, retraining some of the staff and the resources to be able to, you know, understand the 21st century digital side of things so that some of their operations, which is moving online, but still needs manpower, or human resources to be able to drive that. So building capability and relationships. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. And the last one that we look at is in particular is the understanding of value chain. Now here, sometimes you will see companies look at vertical integration. Sometimes you look at companies having horizontal integration. So when you look at those concepts, what we do tend to see is that at some stage when companies look at, you know, um, realizing that, the market is becoming very competitive and they will need to look at, um, you know, um, let's put it this way. Um, uh, they would need to primarily look at, you know, going to market with their products and services in a, in a play. Um, let's, let me put it this way. When a company basically looks at selling their products and services in the market, even if it's a charity, when you look at any sector, what they will always look at is they will do a bit of an analysis to see who are their key competitors, what are their strengths, what are the weaknesses, what could be the threats which are coming across from, you know, different organizations which offer the same products and services in the market. So in order for them to look at creating a competitive business model, in order for them to save costs, what they then start to do is do a bit of introspection into checking uh, you know, the various aspects of uh, the way the product and service is actually produced. So they look at their suppliers, their manufacturing process, they look at, you know, uh, things like their uh, logistics, uh, they look at transportation, warehousing, for example, they look at spends being done on, you know, sales and advertising or marketing, and in some cases, how much they are actually spending on, you know, when they look at providing customer support, because a lot of companies which provide products and services, when we look at the healthcare sector in particular, it is totally service oriented and here the customers expect, you know, uh, a certain amount of service levels uh, to be adhered to. And, and then they have to provide these services within those required standard levels in order for them to continue and be viable in terms of business. The reason why a lot of companies look at doing this is that if they know where costs can be trimmed, if they know where savings can be done, where uh, in which areas there are issues which are uh, arising because of uh, maybe the process or procedures not being followed. No, in those cases, what the, we will see is that the companies, what why they are trying to do this is businesses, organization companies, they're trying to do this is because they want to understand and pinpoint what are the key areas in which these issues or problems can be faced. 
And in those cases, when they understand that these are areas of gap, they then refocus on building capability and capacity within those areas so that it is able to support the business. Now, this could mean, if I give you an example here, when I say value chain, what we are looking at is, when we understand value chain would be that if I have to break down a particular product and service and see how it is taken to market, you will see that uh, the diagram which is on the slide, which basically says that at some stage when the product design is being made, or in some cases when we see uh, the service is ready to be offered, then in those cases, before it goes into production, the entire planning is done. When the service or the product is produced and it is going to go to market being uh, in terms of going to the shelves, we look at, they look at planning, you know, how much is to be stored, what is the inventory levels to be maintained, how the distribution of that product is to be done, how much money is to be spent in sales and marketing and advertising to generate demand, and then in some cases, what we also see is what kind of support would be required. Now, ignore the word student support here, but what kind of service support would be required, you know, when we look at um, understanding from a prospect of, um, you know, the service support required for uh, providing customer service. So when we look at that, we, they need to put adequate resources in place, whether it's call center support, whether it's engineer support, and where the costs can be trimmed. So they divide them into something called, you know, primary activities and support activities. So when we look at that, the human resources department is able to calculate the cost involved in producing that product or that service. And when they know the, what is called the bill of material cost, at to a certain extent, when we know that, I don't know whether you picked it up, in the news yesterday there was, um, there was uh, in the BBC News, there was uh, a, uh, there was a coverage on um, NHS spending about 180 million pounds every year, uh, which is based, uh, which is which is the funds actually it provides uh, to a institute or a or organization based up in Scotland, which looks after the needs of uh, children uh, who have autism or you know special needs. And there's an investigation which was undertaken into that because. They found that the kind of money which has been sent and uh, there are lots of complaints being received and the kind of service which is supposed to be provided is not being provided by the, uh, is not being, and the service level agreements which have been signed or agreed to is are not being adhered by the provider. So NHS has gone in and obviously done a bit of an investigation uh, with that particular organization. And what they found is though the kind of work that they are doing is definitely helping, but the way in which the services are being delivered are not making sense, are not uh, viable, uh, you know, to be sustained in the long run. So when you look at that and you try and understand each and every aspect of how this service is being maintained, that is where it becomes important for HR to understand the whole value chain, you know, from where it comes, where it goes, how it goes, how much is being spent at each stage. If that is known to HR, then at some stage when decisions have to be done, they clearly know where the trimming can happen uh, or where the, the resources can be, you know, uh, the inventory can be reduced or the reduction in resources is is possible without affecting the operations, the, the core operations of the company. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. This is something called value chain analysis and we kind of borrow it from, you know, one of the key frameworks which uh, we do get to see uh, within, you know, business and management field. But the idea there is the HR also key needs to understand what is the value chain within the process of, say, recruitment and selection leading up to somebody leaving the organization, how much money is spent, how much time is, the, you know, spent, what is gained and what is lost. But what they try and do is analyze the each and every aspect of that uh, particular, you know, uh, uh, chain within the ecosystem to see from the time they place the advert to recruitment, to selection, to somebody being inducted, receiving training, at some stage, you know, coming, going through the probation or the trial period and then becoming a permanent employee and end up ends up leaving in a couple of years. What is the total amount spent and what are the kind of various organizations involved at various steps? And if they know the breakup of that cost, it allows them to understand how quickly, the, you know, sometimes uh, they can replenish, replace, or in some cases, you know, recruit people 
in order to fulfill that gap. Now, having understood broadly the different types of strategies which HR can employ, what we want to be able to understand is what kind of uh, you know applications these strategies can have when HR wants to actually you know deploy them within the organization. Now, I'm going to just quickly recap on one of the things when we look at the HR you know side of things. There is something which is quite popularly known, and uh, you know it came about uh, uh, quite a number of decades back, which is what how HR looked at you know human resources in general. So there were two approaches to HR. One was soft, and the other was hard HRM. So when we look at the soft and hard HRM approach, uh, you know in this case when uh, the company looks at deploying. Uh, you know, strategies within the organization. Sometimes you will see they take up a very, uh, you know, basic side of, uh, you know, things, which is to look at soft deployment or hard deployment. Now, there are differences between the two. Here, what we normally see is that depending on how the employees are treated within the organization, uh, we will define that approach as either a soft approach or a hard approach. Now, the two differences in general, which is, you know, which we normally tend to, tend to see between soft and hard HRM is that in hard HRM, the organization treats the employees just as a resource, nothing else. So what they say is if we pay the employee, we ask him to do this job, they have to do the job at the end of the day. And that approach primarily tends to be what is called the, you know, the hard approach. And in a soft approach, what we do generally tend to see is that the organization is generally concerned about the well-being of the individual and ensures that you know, the relevant resources which are required to be able to perform the job, complete the particular objective, are actually provided to the, uh, you know, employee. So here, in the soft approach, we will see uh, that the, you know, workers are treated fairly. They are quite important or staff is quite important for the company because they feel human resources are important for, you know, the growth of the company or for the success of the organization. But in the hard approach, what we do get to see is that, you know, they generally consider staff as one of the resource and there the focus of hard HRM is to look at that the task at the end of the day needs to be done, the goal needs to be achieved, the cost may be needing, you know, if I look at different aspects, the cost uh, needs to be controlled and come what may, uh, you know, that approach is what the organization's HR ends up taking and that will fall into something called you know, hard HRM. So there's a small table which I've done, uh, which, you know, obviously I've gleaned from the internet, but it kind of nicely summarizes the concepts and the differences between the two, uh, you know, from an approach perspective, because here in this particular assessment criteria, what we want to be able to do is we need to assess the HR strategies to see uh, their application in a particular organization. So that is where I would look at, you know, picking up the network rail example, which I've looked at. But before I go into um, that particular example, in terms of how this, uh, you know, strategy or how a particular strategy is deployed, we do get to see, let's look at some of the examples in terms of where we say these organizations are HR oriented, or, you know, here the HR department is quite active and, you know, the employees are looked after uh, by within the organization. There are some examples. So when we look at some of the, uh, you know, best examples of how uh, important the function of HR is within the organization. We look at some of the companies like, you know, Nissan, for example, which have developed the concept of Kaizen, borrowed from Toyota, uh, which is continuous improvement. Kaizen stands for continuous improvement. And here, the employees, uh, you know, the, the, the employer, which is Nissan, actually they empower the workforce to continuously improve, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the way they perform the job. Or if they feel that there is an improvement which can be done, they will invest uh, money and resources on that to be able to get improvements, uh, you know, as far as possible. When we look at, you know, another company, which is, say, for example, BT, um, you know, during and I took the example of, uh, you know, the recession, uh, the recent recession we saw in 2007-8. What we did see is that, interestingly enough, the HR department there, you know, even during that uh, trying time, the, you know, try to support and retain as many number of employees as possible. They tried to redeploy, uh, you know, the HR basically tried to redeploy some of these staff rather than laying them off or making them redundant. 
to say that if we lose this talent, we lose it forever. So they tried to retain that talent, and that is where you know the strategies of HR department actually stand out. And there are a few of these examples which we look at because uh, when the recession hit, a lot of companies you know took this as a opportunity to trim this uh, you know human resources. Do away with a lot of people, made a lot of people redundant. Even BD did that, to be honest, to a larger extent. But when we look at their internal philosophy and ethos, was to try and see if they can redeploy uh, uh, some of these resources internally in order for them to at least be still with Steve, still be with the company, but in a way, you know, um, uh, not lose lose the resource which has been developed over the years. Uh, through training, development, and, you know, uh, has been performing well within the organization. So when we go to the HR side of plan, um, you know, which I want to look at is how do we look at assessing this for a particular organization? What, how do we see the strategies being deployed? So this particular handout of Network Rail, uh, you know, is a good handout uh, because it shows this particular thing holistically. You know, what are the key bits that they have, uh, you know, HR look. This is a planning document which they have produced. And this planning document basically, you know, uh, is strategic in nature because, uh, you know, what they look at is they have done this planning from a point of view of managing, deploying, and implementing the strategies which would make the human resources or the, you know, staff or people, uh, workers working within the organization uh, you know, feel wanted, feel important, and uh, and then as a result of their loyalty and motivation, how does the organization go out and, you know, meet the annual objectives or, you know, the uh, key targets which have been set by the management. So this is a good document to read to understand this particular learning outcome because how you create a document which is talking about human resources strategy, how it links into the key vision and mission of the organization, um, how they define, uh, you know, the key objectives and then related to HR priorities, you know, is being very, uh, you know, uh, nicely explained. And when you read this document, it gives you a very good understanding in terms of what we have theoretically covered uh, in this unit in learning outcome one, two, and three is actually you will be able to see that it is being deployed by Network Rail in this particular document when they look at, uh, you know, creating this, uh, uh, as a as a bit of a guide, uh, let me put it this way: as a bit of a guide, uh, you know, uh, considering um, the deployment, uh, you know, across the organization because they're in different locations, they have number of employees in thousands, and they're uh, you know some of the uh, uh, some of the key functions which some of the employees do are quite critical to the whole network rail, uh, you know, uh, whole infrastructure of network, uh, whole infra net network infrastructure in general. Uh, you know, as far as the rail network is concerned in the UK. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Any questions on this? Not really, no, not at the moment. All right. So in general, I would say, uh, along with the presentation, I will provide this particular handout, and that will allow you to nicely recap, and also maybe you could look at uh, referring to this document primarily to, you know, uh, do the tasks of the assignment which will, wherein you can probably look at bringing your organization in, but pick out some of the key elements which are defined in this HR plan to see how sometimes, you know, budgeting is done, how sometimes, for example, uh, they look at the costs, when they look at, uh, you know, salaries across the year, how they do look at, you know, recruitment uh, through and working through contractors, you know, things which are related to financials of the organization, but also quite important because, uh, human resources to a certain extent is the second highest cost within network rail as far as, uh, you know, resources are concerned. So physical resources, fine, uh, whatever they do. But apart from that, you know, the second highest cost as of now is for human resources and why is it important for HR to understand the whole value chain in terms of where the costs are deployed, where the cost is actually going in on a day-in, day-out basis so that if there is a plan B, which the organization has to look at because of recession, changes in economic climate, or, you know, the requirements uh, from a point of view of customer's perspective, they know exactly where the costs can be trimmed, where the costs can be done away with. And in those cases, this kind of a document produced by HR 
uh, which is like an annual or a strategy document is quite helpful because it defines everything uh, quite clearly in terms of roles, responsibilities, and gives a snapshot of how the whole thing works within our organization. Okay. Is that okay? So okay. what I'm going to do is um, look at stopping here for today and then email the presentation and also this particular uh, handout to you to cover Learning Outcome 3. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and I will cover the last Learning Outcome and we'll start risk management in the subsequent session. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Christina. Thanks for joining in. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.